were to log on to my Spotify, you would find a little bit of everything. You'd find the oldies, according to my children, Ace of Bass, Boys to Men, One Direction. I know, I saw the sign, best song ever, right? We're not from the 90s, no. Then the even older oldies, Elvis, Ricky Nelson, the Monkees. Oh, who doesn't love the Monkees? We've got Worship, I Love Elevation, Maverick City, Hillsong, Brandon Lake. There's musical theater on there, Phantom of the Opera, Evan Hansen, which, by the way, every time my kids get in the car and I'm listening to Evan Hansen, I'm like bawling because my oldest daughter sang with her choir a selection from Evan Hansen at graduation, and I cannot get through it without sobbing. Les Mis, some current hits. Come on, who doesn't love some Taylor Swift, right? Shake it off. Some country, some classical, some pop. And also, yes, what I've been told by my children is the universally acknowledged official mom playlist. I've got a feeling, happy, and can't stop the feeling from the motion picture masterpiece that is Trolls. The point here being, I love music. All of the music. So much so that anybody else here, like me, do you headline a concert in the bathroom mirror when you're getting ready? Yes, I see some brave souls are nodding yes along with me. Yes, with the, you know, the hairbrush for the microphone and imaginary backup dancers. You know, because you need the whole production if it's going to be good. I love all of the sounds and the styles and how I connect to different songs in different periods of my life. And then as that season passes, when I happen to hear that song again, it takes me back to that moment, that memory. Because it's true that music defines key moments in our lives. Now, maybe there's a pivotal moment in your life that is inextricably linked to a particular song. Maybe graduation, maybe a wedding, an achievement, or a, just a special moment in time with friends and family. Whether it's a happy recollection, maybe it's a hard one. Often we find ourselves somewhere in between. Music powerfully connects our emotions, our memories, and our timelines. In fact, psychology today says our long-term memory can be divided into two distinct types, implicit memory and explicit memory. Explicit memory is a deliberate conscious remembering of the past, like textbook learning or exponential memories, things that must be consciously brought into awareness. Now, implicit memories are our unconscious, and automatic memories. It's playing a musical instrument. It's recalling the words to a song when someone sings the first few words. A large part of memory takes place in the unconscious mind. An event, an emotion, and a song get connected through implicit memory. When a piece of music is paired with a very emotional event, it can be an effective cue to bring back the song emotion the strong emotion from that song that was felt at that moment. Isn't that interesting? I also found this very interesting to note. Memories stimulated by music often come from certain times in our lives. Our teenage years and 20s are especially important and exciting times as we experience things for the first time. So if any of you are wondering where your music preferences come from, music preference is also formed around the middle teenage years. Hence the ace of bass, right? But the power of music doesn't stop there. It goes one step further by holding inherent within itself the ability to influence the mood of the listener and even the very atmosphere. Music can change not just the emotion of the moment, but the tone of the entire day. What we listen to impacts how we feel, how we interact with others, and how we perceive the world around us. 
Because it's true that what we surround ourselves with is what we carry forward. This is true in friendship, in the workplace, in social media, and in entertainment, including books, movies, and yes, music. And it's always astounding to me, in the best possible way, how praise and worship music can change the atmosphere. It changes not just my mood, but it can change the atmosphere of the entire room. Has anyone else experienced that? It's incredible. I've learned that as much as I love my cool mom playlist, just FYI, I've been told that when you reference yourself as cool, your kids think you're even cooler. No, not so much. I listen to it in small doses. But listening to music that glorifies God puts a completely different spin on my day that when I'm listening to music that doesn't. Do we ever notice that we can just feel blah sometimes when we're listening to the top 40, no matter how cheery it might be, but when the praise music hits, our mood actually physically shifts. It's a phenomenon designed intentionally by God. In fact, according to the Atlanta Institute of Music and Media, in experiments where people looked at a happy face or a sad face, the music they listened to affected how they perceived it. It influenced what they saw. So if you were listening to happy music, a more neutral face was more likely to be viewed as happy, and vice versa. And I think it's interesting, too, to note that this study, it used what they call happy music. So imagine how much more this would be compounded when we consider if they were using music that glorified our Heavenly Father. The Journal of Positive Psychology conducted a study in 2013 that discovered that individuals who listened to music that could be classified as happy and upbeat were able to improve their mood and overall happiness in just a few weeks. Then the study went one step further, taking it beyond the mood of one listener to an entire group, asking what happens when a collective group of people share mood-boosting music together in one space. And here's what they found. The beat of the song that we're listening to can even influence our heart rate. And when people sing together, just like we've done today, their breathing becomes synchronized. And when our breathing becomes synchronized, it actually produces, hormonally, positive emotions. Isn't that incredible? We're all feeling good now. That was an incredible worship set this morning. Can we give the worship team, actually? Let's just give them some honor. Our worship team, I am so proud of them. They are throwing open that throne room of heaven. And what a privilege and an honor it is that we get to worship and praise and come right into the feet of Jesus. It's powerful. The moments, the mood or atmosphere, the praise, three powerful concepts of God-created song made even more powerful by the understanding that the number three, moments, mood, or atmosphere, and praise, the number three used throughout the whole expanse of scripture represents completeness. So the number three is a divine stamp of fulfillment. So it comes as no surprise that this completeness of song plays an influential role in scripture. We know that we find it throughout the word of God, but also in a collected volume of poem and prayers that we call psalms. An entire book centered right in the middle of our Bible, dedicated very specifically to the heart of music. Music matters. It's important. It's beloved by God. When we come together on Sunday, praise and worship, what we experienced here today, it is actually the only part of the corporate service that edifies God and God alone. And that's very humbling when we stop and we think about that. Because the message, yes, this time today, it honors God, but it also edifies us. 
which is what God intended. Prayer honors God. We know that it does. But it also includes application to him for our needs, which again was designed purposefully by God for his children. Reading scripture honors God and grows our relationship with him. And we receive maturity. We receive knowledge that's intentional from the heart of our father. But again, praise and worship is only created by God to honor God, to edify him and him alone. And when it is done with a seeking heart, he responds to it wholeheartedly. That tells us that music matters. In fact, it matters so much that music is one of the biggest areas in our lives where the enemy, have you noticed this? The enemy will try to lay claim when it comes to music. Many theologians postulate, according to Ezekiel 28, 13, and they use the King James Version, that Satan was heavily involved in music in heaven before he fell. Now, it's accepted that we cannot definitively prove this, but using context from scriptures, theologians believe if he wasn't the worship leader in heaven before the fall, he was very instrumental in music before the fall. So whether it can be proven here on earth or not, this would then make sense as to why music can be such a dynamic force in our lives, because that, it makes sense why it could be so easily attacked why it could impact our memories, why it could impact our mood, and why in its purest form it must be created for God and God alone. I don't know about you, but I know for myself, I think knowing that, it does give me pause when I'm deciding what music I'm going to choose to listen to. Because do I want to open the door to my Heavenly Father? Or do I want to open the door to music that is not music that was ever intended to be? We have to know that praise and worship is a pivotal part of our glory of God. And I believe David, the shepherd boy who became a king, a man after God's own heart, he understood this. For he expressed his love, his admiration, and his honor for his God through music. Much of Psalms is a window into his life experience. We see the sad, the hopeful, the angry, the rejoicing, and first and foremost, we see hope and we see praise throughout the entire book. We see memories. We see mood or atmosphere. We see praise. We see that Psalms is the playlist of David's life and ours as well. And that's what we're digging into today as we continue our series, Soundtrack to Life, King David's Summer Playlist. Would you pray with me as we deep dive into Psalms today? Lord, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for creating song, for giving the gift of music to your people. Our playlist, Lord, it revolves around you, and our worship is created for you and you alone. Let our hearts be filled with your word, our atmosphere with your presence, and our future with your praise. In the mighty, the beautiful, and the victorious name of Jesus Christ, together the church said, amen. Like King David, our songs are an expression of our story. When they are linked together into the playlist of our lives, what will the entirety say about this life we have lived? Will it be a playlist filled with lament? and sorrow, or victory, and hope. And truthfully, because we're human, we understand it will be a little bit of both. And that is okay. Because as we see in the book of Psalms, there is purpose in each. And when we understand the purpose, we are released to live a playlist that glorifies God, that speaks to the power of who he is and who he will continue to be. If you'd like to, please turn with me to the book of Psalms today. We're going to do a survey overview of the book for a few moments. So we'll be flipping through the pages just a little bit because it's important to understand the intentionality of this book as it's much more than might first meet the eye. 
So we know that Psalms is comprised of 150 Hebrew poems, songs and prayers from many different periods in Israel's history. And through these songs, we are connected to key moments in the Israelites' past, their memory, which are reflective of the mood, the emotions, and the atmosphere of the authors. They are sung as praise to the, of the everlasting faithfulness of our God. We know that one-third of the songs are anonymously written, while others are written by worship leaders in the temple, as well as Solomon and Moses. And almost half, 73, are written by King David. There is a very intentional arrangement, in fact, in the book of Psalms. And because of this, it is actually at least once in our Christian walk to read the book in order, beginning to end. Because like many books that we will read in our lifetime, Psalms begins with an introduction. This is actually Psalms 1 and 2, both of which are anonymously written. Together, these two psalms tell us that this book, the book of Psalms, is designed to be the prayer book of God's people as they strive to be faithful to the commands of the Torah as they wait for the future messianic kingdom. Now, this introduction of these first two psalms is followed by five large sections in which the final poem in each section ends with a very similar phrase. May the Lord, the God of Israel, be blessed forever and ever. Amen. And when we dig into each section, we'll find that each one revolves around a particular theme. Section 1 is a call to covenant faithfulness. Section 2 echoes the prophets about the coming king who will rule all of the nations. Section 3 remembers Israel's exile and asks God to never forget his promises. While section 4 calls upon God for mercy and celebrates the future day when God will bring his kingdom throughout the entire world. Section 5 is Psalms 107 to 145. And it's a little different from the first four sections because it includes two mini sections. Hallel and the Songs of Ascent. So Hallel is a Hebrew word meaning praise. It's related to the term hallelujah, which means, we know, praise to God. And it comprises Psalms 113 through 118, with Psalm 136, known as the Great Hallel. In fact, James Montgomery Bryce, he describes Psalm 136 this way. In Jewish tradition, Psalm 136 has been called the great Hillel, or great psalm of praise. It does not use the words hallelujah, but it is called the great for the way it rehearses God's goodness in regard to his people and encourages them to praise him for his merciful and steadfast love. In fact, Psalm 136, it is the only psalm with a very unique structure of repeating one phrase, his faithful love endures forever within every single verse. It was designed as corporate worship, as a call to praise. And we're going to keep this one in mind because we're going to come back to Psalm 136 in a moment. Now the second mini section within section 5 are the songs of ascent. These are Psalms 120 to 134. They are written during the 70-year exile of the Judeans after they were captured by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Tangibly, these psalms represent their oppression, their longing to return to Jerusalem, their hope for future generations. But spiritually, they begin when the believer is at a low point. They process through spiritual maturity, through gratitude, and they conclude with praise and worship of the goodness of God. And both of these mini sections, they end with a message about the coming kingdom. And together, they sustain the hope of God to redeem his people. So the book of Psalms then concludes with a short collection of five psalms, a conclusion, 146 to 150. These are poems of praise to our Heavenly Father, with each beginning and ending with the same phrase, praise the Lord. Pastor Rob spoke about one of these psalms last week as he opened this series, praise the Lord. 
Now we can see when we look at the book as a whole that songs of lament, they dominate sections one, two, and three. It's the hard stuff. Sometimes we start in the hard stuff. But the second theme of Psalms is that of praise. It's celebration. These are songs that draw attention to what is good in the world. And as we read through the book of Psalms, we'll notice as we get to sections four and five that praise begins to outnumber the songs of lament. And by the time we've reached the conclusion, it is praise after praise after praise. Praise dominates the conclusion of the book of Psalms. And it's interesting because the Bible Project says this. This shift from lament to praise is profound. It tells us about the nature of prayer. There is tension created as we look out at the tragic state of our world and our lives. And so the Psalms teach us not to ignore the pain of our lives. But at the same time, biblical faith is forward looking into the promise of God's future. Torah and Messiah, lament and praise, faith and hope. This is the book of Psalms. And we can see that the intentionality in the framework of this book, it matters. Because it builds upon itself over and over and over again, drawing us from our pain and sorrow into those glimpses of praise. Until gradually, our praise outweighs our pain. And our eyes are fixed on our coming king. And we are speaking the hope of God's steadfast love in a great Hillel, a praise to God despite all things. So it makes sense then that this is a reflective of the playlist of our lives. It was true for King David, and it's true for us as well. I don't know about you, but I know that I can spend a lot of time in lament. Things are not working the way I thought they should be working. But there is praise too. And as we begin to focus on the praise, we see the praise. It grow and it matures and it blossoms in our lives. And before you know it, we're starting to see the praise before we see the lament or maybe in spite of the lament. And in the end, we know there is victory. Like the book, we are going to end with hope. Why? Because we know that we know that we know that we know that our Jesus is coming. He's coming into this situation, church. Whatever is in front of you, he's coming into this moment. He's coming into our relationships, into our hurt and our pain. He is coming into this world for you and I. And I believe in Alaska as it is in heaven and even more. He's preparing eternity while he's at it. But we know that knowing that is sometimes easier than walking that out. Am I right? Trusting him, allowing him to take our sorrow and our pain, moving us from that place of desecration to that place of his dominion. So the question becomes, how do we set our minds and hearts as we journey from lament to praise in all things? Through the power of music as evidenced by the Psalms, through memories, through mood or atmosphere, and through our heavenly praise. Let's look at the first one. Let's look at memories. What has God done in your life, in my life? Where has he moved? Do we take time to reflect on these moments with intentionality and with purpose? Do we take time to be cognizant of all that God has done? 
Because when we are in doing so, in taking the time to recognize, yes, Lord, that was you. I saw you. I saw your hand. Maybe I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, Lord, I see, I saw, I know that you moved. And when we do that, when we can learn to recognize his movements, we're going to see them quicker in the present. We're going to grab onto that hope with a lot quicker reflexes because we can recognize where the hand of God moves. We don't honor the memory, but we honor our Father through that memory. Now, one memory that jumps out to me in King David's life is Psalm 3. Right in the very beginning of the book, the beginning of section 1, and we know from 2 Samuel 15 through 17 that his own son, King David's own son Absalom, he wants to kill him. And what has to be a devastating period, I can only imagine, in David's life. Knowing that not only is his kingship on the line, but his family relationships are literally falling apart. And we can relate to that. Maybe our career is not where we hoped it would be. There's breakdown in our relationships. Family is not working like we have this idea that family should. And life just feels hard. And yet, we see that David still finds the moments where God has moved, where he has seen, without a shadow of a doubt, the hand of God. And this is what we cling to as we move from lament to praise in our own stories. That maybe, maybe it's minuscule, but it's vitally important. That small moment, the hand of God in all things. And it takes intentionality to see the small moments. To look at that big picture sometimes and to recognize right here in this second I know God, I know that was you, and I'm going to cling to that with both hands and all of my heart. We know that David begins in verse 1, Oh Lord, I have so many enemies, so many are against me. He's lamenting. And yet in verse 5, he says, I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. How small, yet how momentous. How quiet of a statement, yet how profound. Because despite everything going on in my life, I was able to go to sleep. That right there, that's the hand of God when we're in some tough situations. To get some rest. That's huge when our world is falling apart around us. And David says, not only was I able to sleep, but you protected me, Lord. He says, tangibly, yes, my life is still my own. You have kept me safe physically. I still walk this earth, but also in heart. Because David was also acknowledging here that the Lord was keeping his heart in a safe place. The Lord was protecting that love, that emotion, that feeling. And that's huge when our world is falling apart. How often do we pray for protection of our body, but forget to pray for the protection of our heart? That's actually a prayer that God has given me for my children. I pray every day for the protection of their physical bodies. But even more than that, I pray that the Lord guards and protects their hearts. It matters. And I think King David would have gone back over and over again to this song, for it was a memory for him of God's faithfulness, of God's goodness in that horrendous moment of his life. And when we go back ourselves and we revisit and we reread and we meditate upon all of the ways that we have seen God be God and be good in our lives, even when our world is not, we continue our journey from that of lament to that of praise. The psalm that I always go back to when I'm scared, a lot of us know it, 
It's Psalm 23. And while I didn't have quite the experience of running from my life like David did, I was young and scared, and Psalm 23 became my song of safety and my song of praise. As a little girl, I was by myself. We were flying out of Juneau, which is one of the most difficult takeoffs in the world. It's one of three. And we hit what I now know is called a wind shift. But as a little girl, all I knew at the time was that the plane was dropping straight down, people were screaming, and carry-ons were flying everywhere. And while the pilot, he regained control, he's trained for that, I couldn't fly without full-scale panic attacks well into my adult years. And every time I would fly, and that attack would start to hit, I would repeat Psalm 23 over and over and over again. The Lord is my shepherd. Verse 4, I will not be afraid, for you, Lord, are close beside me. Until one day, and this is just a couple of years ago, our plane hit quite a lot of turbulence. We know the captain comes on. Attendants, please be seated. And it didn't bother me. I thought, it's okay. God's got me. We're good. And all of a sudden, it hit me like a flash of lightning. I realized that I had journeyed from lament to praise in this piece of my life. And now Psalm 23 is not just a psalm of praise for me. When I read it, it is a precious memory. Every time I read it, I am reminded over and over again of God's faithfulness in my own life, his care and protection of a scared little girl. And that memory gives me the courage to know that I know that I know that I am safe in his presence, not just in an airplane, but in all things. Memories matter. Repeat the scriptures that God has spoken to you. Write them down. Write down the promises he's given you. This is your music. These promises are your songs and your psalms to your heavenly father. They are a vital piece of the playlist of your story. Number two, the second piece of moving from lament to praise. It's mood or the atmosphere. Remember how music, our worship to our Jesus, can change it all? What then is the atmosphere that we are allowing, allowing, key word, to permeate our soul, our homes, and our workplaces? Psalm 103, again written by King David, celebrates the Lord's compassion, goodness, and forgiveness. And I love what this song speaks into the atmosphere. It speaks restoration and redemption. Despite every single time that we have messed up, the, it speaks of the grace of the Lord in forgiving us over and over and over again. Even though David was a man after God's own heart, we have to only look at his life to see he did not have it all figured out. There were some really hard moments, many of his own making, in his life. We know from scripture that he took another man's wife, Bathsheba, and then had the man, her husband, Uriah, very conveniently killed in battle. In fact, there's a psalm. Saul, David has written a song of lament about that very situation, Psalm 51. But I think Psalm 103 is very easily a song written of a compilation by David reflecting on his own mistakes. Because he doesn't name them individually within the psalm, but we can see and we can empathize with every single one of his emotions. I'm going to read a couple of verses. Psalm 103, 8 through 12. This is what David wrote. The Lord is compassionate and merciful slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. 
He does not punish us for all our sin. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. We can hear David's heart, his regret, and his lament in those words. I think we can empathize with regret and lament in places that we know we totally got it wrong. But yet, what does David do? He focuses on the character of God because it changes everything. His unfailing love. David acknowledges his mistakes, but he speaks of God's restorative character. He speaks it through his very words into the atmosphere. For you, God, are my God of unfailing love. You have removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. What does it look like, church, when we speak forgiveness into the very atmosphere? When we speak it into our own lives, because the hardest person to forgive is usually ourselves. When we speak it into our families, our homes, our workplaces, our moments, our situations, what changes when we release God's power of forgiveness into the atmosphere? You know, my son, my middle son, he was little, and he was just, he was this restorative power of forgiveness for me when he was a little guy. He was just a little, and he just had this precious heart, and he and I had inter interaction, and I had just messed up. Like, I had royally messed up in talking to him. And I'd gotten upset over something that just didn't matter. And after we calmed down, I came back to him and I said, buddy, will you forgive mom? I'm really sorry. And what I remember most about this moment is that he didn't even pause. He just immediately responded with, it's okay, mom. I love you. And that was all. He moved on. And I remember just standing there feeling like my world had just shifted. I was completely blown away. And I thought, I just walked with Jesus in the person of my son. And I remember thinking, Lord, thank you for that picture. Because I was having a hard time forgiving myself from just a lot of stuff. And in that moment, through my son, Jesus said, you know what? It's okay, my daughter. I love you. Done. It changes the atmosphere. My son released forgiveness into the atmosphere of our home. And it changed everything. I will tell you, it's never been the same in the best way possible. What atmosphere, church, are we praying, speaking, praising into existence? Not just for ourselves, but for others too. Because, you know, there is an atmospheric psalm that I have written in my office upstairs. It's one that I have prayed. Our team, this church has prayed over this city for many years because I believe it is a prayer that changes the atmosphere. And I believe it is a prayer to change this atmosphere of this very city where we live. Psalm 46, verse 5. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. 
And then verse 11, the Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. And church, we're praying that into our city. And what would it look like if you prayed, if we prayed that into our homes? God dwells in my home. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us, right here. The God of Israel is our fortress. Church, what would it look like to speak that into the atmosphere of our lives and our home and our moments? Everything changes. Memories mood or atmosphere the power of music it's important in our journey and as i move myself from a life of lament to a life of praise i ask the lord lord give me a word to release to pray to release into the atmosphere and the year word the lord gave me is joy and i've been praying that god grow joy in me that's the atmosphere I pray will permeate my life, our home, our city. And I don't know if you've prayed for joy yourself, but I've learned that it's a lot like praying for patience. The minute you pray for it, it's really hard to live in it. Because now we've voiced it. Because all of a sudden, the enemy now, he knows where to attack. Because the truth is, the enemy doesn't know if we don't voice it. He's not omniscient, omniscient. He can't read our mind like God can. He can only go off the clues we put out there and the playbook of things that have worked against all humanity for all time against us. And it's scary because we know that when we put it out there, Lord, I am speaking your joy into the atmosphere. Lord, I am speaking your protection into the atmosphere. Lord, I am speaking your forgiveness into this atmosphere. It gets scary because we've put it out there and all of a sudden the enemy knows and he can go on the defense, but that's why church, we have to hold tight to our praise the enemy we know cannot withstand the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord. And when we sing it, we praise it to the heavens. The enemy doesn't stand a chance. Because we can't live in fear of speaking into the atmosphere. We can't live in fear of speaking God's promises with boldness and courage and faith and trust to stand on his promises, all 6,000 of them, and say, yes, Lord, because of who you are, I am speaking this into my now, my tomorrow, and my future. We can't be scared of putting it out there. It matters. It's too important. And we face it head on with our armor of the living God. We work through it and we grow through it. And I love this actually, that when we read the armor of God, there's no armor for our back. I love that because we keep our face forward. We're not turning around church. We're not scared. We're not running the other direction. Why? Because Jesus because he is good and he is faithful and he has promises and plans and he has our hope, our future, and our victory. So church, we're going to put on that armor of God. We're going to stand forward with courage. We're going to face lament head on and we're going to say, not today. Not today because of who my Jesus is because of the things that I have seen him do over and over and over again. Because I am speaking his very name. We together as the body of Christ are speaking his very name into the atmosphere. And we are singing praise to who he is and who he will be forevermore. We're going to close together with Psalm 136. It's going to be on the screen. 
where you can follow along in your scripture. And Psalm 130, 136 is a corporate song of praise. It was intended by the ancient Hebrew authors. Again, what is it called? The great Hillel, the great praise, the great hallelujah. This song flips the script for our lives by phrasing each hard moment, not in the lament, but in the victory. In our prayer, as we speak this corporately, as we stand together and we speak Psalm 136 with courage and conviction, that this will be our song and our prayer as we walk from a life of lament to a life of praise in all things, in all moments, and most importantly, of our Jesus. Psalm 136, my husband's going to help me. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And all together we said, his faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who alone does mighty miracles. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who placed the earth among the waters. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. His faithful love endures forever. The sun to rule the day. His faithful love endures forever. And the moon and stars to rule the night. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who killed the firstborn of Egypt. His faithful love endures forever. He brought Israel out of Egypt. His faithful love endures forever. He acted with a strong hand and a powerful arm. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who parted the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. He led Israel safely through. His faithful love endures forever. But he hurled Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who led his people through the wilderness. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who struck down mighty kings. His faithful love endures forever. He killed powerful kings. His faithful love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites. His faithful love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan. His faithful love endures forever. God gave the land of these kings as an inheritance. His faithful love endures forever. A special possession to his servant Israel. His faithful love endures forever. He remembered us in our weakness. His faithful love endures forever. He saved us from our enemies. His faithful love endures forever. He gives food to every living thing. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever. Amen.